Good morning, everyone. A good evening, I guess, depending where we're located. Um, wanted to welcome you to the HLB International uh, Tax Webinar on Transfer Pricing. Uh, this is always a hot topic, so I'd like to introduce uh, myself and my speakers. I am Marina Gentili from uh, Witham, uh, based out of the New York uh, City office, and I lead our global transfer pricing business. Uh, my colleague Jason Fritz is on the line as well. He's a senior manager at Ide Bailey. Um, also joining us is uh, Carlos Camacho from uh, Grupo Camacho in Costa Rica. So he'll give us the Latin American uh, perspective as well. Great, thanks Marina. So this is Jason Fritz coming to you from the very cold Minneapolis. And uh, I'm really excited about today's presentation. It combines uh, two of my favorite things, and that's uh, transfer pricing and talking. <laughs> so uh, ho hopefully everybody will enjoy this. Uh, again, the format's going to be uh, conversational. So the slides are really just meant to kind of help um, help us kind of substantiate what we're talking about, but it's really not the meat of the presentation. Um, what we're going to be doing is, is having a nice conversation about transfer pricing here. So um, why don't we kick it off, Marina and Carlos? So what the heck is transfer pricing? Who wants to, who wants to tell us what it is? <laughs> I can I can jump in quickly on that. Um, so transfer pricing. Are you from, uh, from uh, warm and beautiful Costa Rica. <laughs> That's just for the Minneapolis guy. <laughs> there you go, yeah. uh, Carlos. I'm going to jump in and, and tell us what transfer pricing is. Just set this the foundation, and then uh, and then kick over kick over to your end. But um, basically, you know, internal pricing are charged amongst affiliated companies that transact in, with each other, you know, across a, a global uh, country line is the most common, um, but it does have its presence on the domestic end. You know, anytime there's room for sort of tax manipulation with entities operating at different, uh, you know, with different taxes. And it's also, there are four main areas to it. I think we tend to think about a tangible good, for example, a manufacturer in Japan selling to a related affiliate in the US, you know, the tangible good transfer between a manufacturer and a distributor, but it's also related to services. So it can be GNA services or some um, tech R&D type services. It's related to in intellectual property licensing. Um, someone develops the IP and the rest of, you know, the global affiliates use the IP in selling um, the product. Um, and that, by the way, that's technology related or marketing related IP. So a trade name, brand name as well. Um, and then finally, the fourth cate category would be financing, uh, loans, uh, intercompany loans. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, transfer pricing tends to get a bad reputation in the press. Um, you, you tend to hear about it on the negative slant as if, you know, all these companies are out there trying to manipulate uh, taxes uh, through their transfer pricing. Um, I've been at this about 25 years. Um, you know, I see that very rarely. I, I think, you know, um, there's a lot of, you know, I think it's everyone's right as a uh, multinational to minimize their global tax base, their global effective tax rate. Um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, of course, on the other end is the tax manipulation illegal end of it. And, and somewhere in between is that, you know, that blur line. Um, I yeah, feel like transfer I, pricing is, yeah, just is the economic su substance around it. So yeah, just just on that, you know, I think we what we hear about often are the, the apples, the Googles, the Amazons, um, you know, in the press. And in reality, especially, you know, especially, you know, for HLB clients, it's they're really just trying not to, you know, do do something wrong or create an issue or create an you know double taxation, um, and so they're really just trying to get it right. Um, and so we don't we typically don't see the you know the pushing of the boundaries like some of the the larger multinationals. Yes, I guess one of the things that we all have to have in our minds is the fact that perhaps surprising uh, the the main ground of it is the allocation of profits to the different business units according to the value chain. And having said that, this was the old-fashioned way that multinational enterprises used to allocate departmental and inner departmental cost of doing business 
of a multi-department entities. And in order to allocate such a profit based upon certain parameters, those are being developed within the, the scholars and within the law as the attribution of profits based on the three triggers, which are access, assets, of this assumes and functions performed. And that is totally normal, it's not illegal, it's actually instrumental to uh, measure the management of a, a, any entity, whether that is a local entity or is a multinational entity. When abuse of that is when the topic becomes hotter and hotter and the press releases are becoming just more and more popular. Right. Yeah, that's great. So I think you know we have a lot to talk about today. So I think we're all in agreement on what transfer pricing is. So let's uh, let's move forward. And you know, Marina and I think we should probably talk just a little bit about uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, and maybe its impact. You know, I think one of the, you know there's a there's a bunch of things that really have changed, but only one real thing related to transfer pricing, which was kind of the definition of intangible property has been expanded and in my personal opinion was to fit some of the international tax um, changes or laws that that they they that came about which really need to expand in, uh, in uh, intellectual property to be everything that's essentially not a depreciable asset but um, but really you know the the US tax law has changed the international laws quite a bit which have an impact on transfer pricing and marina what are your thoughts on that yeah uh absolutely i mean it can't be said enough that anyone that's been doing transfer pricing you know a certain way over so many years needs to take a fresh look um you know along with with international tax uh you know, guidance on that as well. There are so many aspects to the new tax law and they all um, they all work together and need to be modeled together. So there's no there's no one size fits all answer. Um, so certainly we need to, to go in on a case by case, case basis, model, see what the issues are and, you know, um, possibly rework the transfer pricing accordingly. L lots of opportunity here. Yeah, for sure. You know, so recent, you know, like, well, you know, 2015, all the talk around transfer pricing was around BEPS, so base erosion and profit shifting. And I, I know personally, <laughs> being, you know, located in the United States, what we've been talking about lately, like we talked about a minute ago, was, is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, but really, we do still need to be mindful of BEPS, you know, and, and really, you know the changes it has brought about um, since you know since the action items were um, essentially published in the fall of 2015. You know, and really, essentially, in a nutshell, we need to think about the you know the globe. It's not just a one country kind of situation anymore. And it, you know, it was always a situation where you had to worry about both sides of a transaction. But now, in terms of you know thinking about transfer pricing, we really need to think of it of its effects globally and not just you know if you have multiple jurisdictions you really need to think of all of them you know and and really the transparency and the fact or whether um, income is being taxed somewhere because that's really what BEPS is all about is making sure that hey you're not just completely avoiding paying tax and it's really you're paying it you're paying it somewhere so um, I guess you know Carlos you know from your perspective what have you seen from um, you know as a result of, of the BEPS initiatives uh, yes, indeed, the, the base erosion profit shifting that was launched by the OECD in 2015 is created a, a lot of turbulence in the uh, local legislation in several countries in Latin America, starting from those that are already members of the OECD as well as those that are candidates to become members of the OECD. Having said that, the approach of BEPS all over the world uh, has a different base. Therefore, the measure of effectiveness of that is still to be seen as long as the first year of these country by country report is uh, just being finished and the filing 
is in the process of uh, getting uh, grabbed together in a depository of the Global Transparency Forum. So I guess that the, the consequences of uh, BEPS as far as legislation are already in place and that is happening almost, almost in all Latin American countries and I've seen that happening as well in Africa and some Asian countries. Uh, but the uh, main results of adjustments of BEPS are going uh, still to be seen perhaps two years from now, uh, but those are going to be a tremor in the international tax arena. Yeah, I I agree completely, Carlos. I think we're just, you know, we're, everyone is getting their, um, you know, the pain of having to comply with this now and what that means and the the burden of collecting all this data and, you know, a lot of it done, you know, some with advisors, but also a lot for these bigger companies, you know, having in-house resources to collect, you know, a lot of this, uh, this data from all the different affiliates. Um, but there definitely remains to be seen, you know, how it's used. Um, you know, these country by country reports are shared um, through through competent authority agreements at, at you know, intergovernment uh, levels. And it's just, um, yeah, it's curious to see how, for example, the, you know, the audit uh, situation shift uh, based on this this new information and um, and whether or not it's going to come down to smaller, you know, right now the threshold is large. It's our, you know, our multinationals, but um, whether this has the opportunity to come down to a lower level of the market, um, you know, I wonder if it's going to go there. Great, thanks. So, let me click here, sorry. Um, so Carlos, um, talk to us what's happening in, in Latin America from a, um, you know, an alignment from a BEPS Action 13 perspective. Um, you know, update us from, you know, from your perspective, what you're seeing. Yeah, there are very uh, few jurisdictions, in fact, that have not uh, aligned the local regulations regarding the uh, three-tier approach for uh, transfer pricing. The three-tier approach consists of the local file, the master file, and the country-by-country -country report. Uh, as it was mentioned by Marina, it's important to bear in mind that uh, as of now, only companies with uh, gross global income uh, of uh, 850 million US are forced to uh, do the uh, C by C reporting filing. Uh, there is still a lot of uh, pressure from uh, the OECD and uh, discussions we have had with uh, uh, Pascal LeBlanc uh, said that the, the trend will be to reduce the threshold. Uh, in order to capture more and more multinational enterprises that may not be public companies. Because transparently speaking, the only ones that are uh, in the loop as of now are those companies that cannot uh, take advantage of uh, creating uh, special purpose vehicles that can just avoid the threshold. And that is the case of uh, uh, the next generation of uh, BEPS 2.0. So basically, Latin America is already adopt all the three-tier approach, which is uh, instrumental for the cooperation of those investments from the developed jurisdictions to the non-developed jurisdictions within Latin America. Yeah, and, and just from a a U.S. perspective in working with clients who have operations in Latin America, you know, a lot, a lot of, I would say, a lot of what has been instituted with BEPS, some of it was kind of in place and just different, you know, depended on the country. But there was a lot of, you know, mid-year or, or you know, multi, you know, multi-timing um, filings in certain Latin American countries um, that were informational based. So. Um, so there may be, there may, may not be a ton of change for some countries, um, Latin American countries, but um, just from a U.S. perspective, I, I I know you know we've had to kind of figure out and look by country, you know, which country has certain filings, you know, during the year that we've had to provide and provide information to the tax authorities. Um, so a question that I frequently get is, 
you know, when should companies focus on transfer pricing? And the answer I uh, frequently give is yes. I know it's, I know it's sarcastic. So, um, it, it, you know, we have a, you know, the bullet point here says never too early, and I can't emphasize that enough. So, you know, transfer pricing should be at any point in a company's life cycle, but especially, especially as companies are expanding or, or starting up and thinking about you know, where they want to locate certain functions and risks. So Carlos mentioned that early on, the functions and risks. So really what it comes down to is where or who or what entity is performing those functions or, or, or bearing those risks or own those assets. And so when it, you're talking about a company in a, in a life cycle, whether it's starting up, expanding, expanding internationally, there's a, a smart way or, or a, a smart tax way of actually planning things out and locating things in a, in a certain jurisdiction that you know it results in a favorable you know tax rate but it's it's not gaming the system it's actually you know there's actually substance there and thinking through it so and and, and yeah. also you know it, it's never too late to think about transfer pricing so um you know there could be business changes or you know there could be certain things that justify a change to where you're locating those functions functions and risks so you know, we can help with that and, and help figure things out. So the answer yeah. is yes. Why don't you agree, Marina? <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree. And Jason, that's a really good point. I always say if if you start from the beginning, you know, as you're establishing your company, as you're, you know, moving into one location, um, you know, you, you set a, um, a, a strategy, a transfer pricing strategy that just grows with your business, right? And at that point, it, it's almost like the the intersection of the best operational and the best tax answer, right? Yes. Um, because that's when you have your options, right? Like later in life, you're not suddenly going to move your, you know, manufacturing plant to a, you know, a lower right. cost jurisdiction or a lower tax jurisdiction, etc. But if you think of these things ahead of time as you're setting up, um, it just you know, it just, it works very, very well. Um, it, you know, I end up working with a lot of tech, uh, you know, emerging tech startup companies and, you know, even pre-revenue, you know, I like to plant the seed um, and, and explain to them that, yeah, your size might not be so big right now, but your intercompany transfers, the nature of them are highly sensitive. Um, anytime you have any kind of IP development, um, or cost sharing, perhaps there's development in two different tax jurisdictions. Uh, there could be stock-based compensation, which is very common uh, with this type of thing. These are all very controversial areas of transfer pricing, um, and they just need to be thought out. I think a little bit, a little bit more, you know, from the beginning, and and you make it clear who actually owns the IP and develops the IP and takes on the cost of it, and who is your service provider. Uh, you know who's doing the the tech R and D uh, services around that. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you, Marina. And you know, one last thing I'll say about that is, you know, if like like I mentioned earlier, you know, most of our clients are just trying to get the transfer pricing right. Um, so if you don't have something in place, so you haven't thought about your transfer pricing, and at least come up with a policy, you know, if not full documentation, but at least you know, really set up your transfer pricing well. And you do come under a transfer pricing audit, the tax authorities then get to impute what they think is the right answer. So instead of having to defeat what you've put out there um, and put in place, they can come in and say, well, you didn't, you don't have anything, so this is what we think the answer should be. So um, definitely important to have your transfer pricing in place early. Yeah, um, and, and it's very important to uh, create the conscience uh, within our clientele base of the difference between compliance with tax uh, transfer pricing and the planning and strategical allocation of right. transfer right. pricing policies, as Marina was mentioning, because most of the people do follow and answer the question of when is the time to uh, go for compliance with transfer pricing internally based upon the chasing of tax authorities. And right. that is the wrong side of the question because then you are in the loop then you have no moving capabilities, and therefore you may just defeat the whole purpose of the appropriate allocation of the value chain analysis. Yep, exactly. 
Yeah, and I kind of skipped ahead to this slide because we kind of started to go there naturally. Um, so, you know, Carlos, you started talking about, you know, compliance versus strategy. And I think, Marina, you had something you wanted to chime in with. I, I just wanted to add one more thing um, because I hear this a lot. Um, I, you know, I hear the comment of, oh, we don't have transfer pricing issues because, you know, we're making losses in the U.S. and we have been, you know, for the last six years. And I, I just, that is such a misconception that I just need to get out there. You know, transfer pricing doesn't only come into play if your company is profitable. Um, you know, if you're making losses in the U.S. for six years running, you know, you're not you're not a startup at this point. You're you know, you've got an established business. Um, something's up there and you could actually be a target because you've had losses for for so many years. And those losses could be driven by misallocation of transfer pricing. Um, you know, possibly your management fee to a foreign parent company is, you know, too high or, you know, whatever, whatever the situation is, maybe the U.S. is taking on more costs than the actual risks of the entity. Um, you know, those losses could, could, tr could indicate a, a transfer pricing issue. So, yeah, you know, I often get asked by other tax professionals, well, what should I be looking out for in terms of transfer pricing? So, you know, you're an expert, Jason, you know what you're, you're talking about, but what should I be looking for? And that's one of those things is NOLs, especially where they don't make a lot of sense, right? So if you have a captive service provider, a low risk type entity that's really kind of doing what it's told, and yet it's earning and it's at a loss or extremely low operating profit, that's one of the top things I think people should be aware of. Why, you know, just ask the question, why is this entity losing money and then take a broader look. Are there entities that are, you know, are profitable in the same kind of group of companies? And you know, right. that's just one of the things I, I recommend people take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, oops. So functions, assets, and risks. Um, it It's really been in place since the beginning of transfer pricing, you know, which I don't know if there ever was a true beginning, but it, it's it's really the foundation of anything when it's you know, transfer pricing related is just looking at who's doing what and where and what risks they're bearing and, you know, and what assets they're utilizing um, to justify that operating profit. I, it's, it's interesting because it, I've, I've been saying lately, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, I don't think that the um, functional analysis has ever been more important than it is today. Um, right. I don't, you know, I mean, it, it, in terms of justifying you know, what's happening from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act perspective, you know, with, you know, different types of planning that international tax folks are doing, we go right back to doing a functional analysis to, to see really who's doing what and where. It lays the foundation for your transfer pricing strategy, right? I mean, I think yeah. a, a lot of times, um, you know, that's that's what, uh, you know, is people aren't getting necessarily about a FAR analysis or a functional analysis. It's not just saying, oh, um, entity A in, uh, you know, Costa Rica is the manufacturer and entity B in, you know, uh, the U.S. is the distributor like the end, you know, it, it needs to have the persuasive argument of, you know, this is what one does relative to the other. This is the risk that they take on. These are the functions. You know, what kind of distributor are they? Are they holding inventory? Um, are they, you know, are they on the contract or are they a bit more of a, a agency or commissionaire structure? Or, you know, there's a lot of sort of digging deep that gets behind it, um, you know, along those lines. Carlos, sure. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well, but I think that the functional analysis is, is just so critical. It is indeed. And actually, one of the things that go along the lines of uh, the functional analysis is the value chain analysis that is proposed in the amendments of uh, BEPS 8910 uh, regarding mainly its services and intergroup and finance, as well as the uh, intangibles due to the fact that in most of the instances, the profit shifting happens in uh, jurisdictions that have some sort of tax benefits. In your example of a Costa Rican manufacturer, if the Costa Rican manufacturer is the beneficiary of a exemption on a free zone status, for instance, it, there might be likely 
to be a shifting of profits to the jurisdiction that is applying no tax to that profit and therefore that could well explain their recurring losses that you were referring to in the other end of the uh, high tax jurisdiction therefore this is critical to be documented appropriately in the functional analysis and furthermore to have clearly stated in your policies that there is no function can that can be no compensation for that function or risk or asset involved in the value chain so most of the issues we are facing in the audit processes in latin america are to do with those functions that are not compensated because they are implicitly involved in the value chain that you can only discover if you do a uh, actual functional analysis that is a complete analysis of all the issues involved that's a yeah that brings up a, a question to me Carlos is you know, I, you know sitting in the United States and we often think of companies developing a lot of intangibles here and then um, sometimes offshoring them to lower tax jurisdictions um, talk to us from a Latin American perspective how often do you see Latin American companies developing you know valuable intangibles because what you're talking about here is where is the true value being driven for a company? Where is it being created? And you know, how often do you see that you know going outbound from a Latin American perspective, um, or maybe even inbound? We have that situation both sides, uh, both inbound and outbound, and mainly uh, with the new digital economy that is happening uh, a lot in uh, software development and intellectual property regarding. Uh, research and development on uh, medical staff. Uh, those uh, kind of uh, uh, intellectual property issues are arising in Latin America as long as the quality of some of uh, researchers in Latin America as well as software developers uh, is becoming more uh, uh, continuous and many of the investors from uh, developed uh, jurisdictions are uh, seeking such a talent in Latin America. And then the question arises on where that intellectual property shall be allocated. And there is a approach uh, actually in BEPS regarding uh, that economical property versus that legal property. The ownership in a legal entity is uh, of minimal impact when compared to who is the real economical beneficiary of that intellectual property. Therefore, the driver for allocation of value shall always follow the pace of who is the economical beneficiary of such an intellectual property, despite of who is the legal owner of that intellectual property. And that's a BEPS discussion that can last for several hours in, in a conference. Oh, sure. Well, I'm not busy for the next couple hours. No, I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> Obviously, we've got to continue on. Um, you know, our our next topic, um, Marina, I'll throw this out to you to find out what are you seeing from a domestic, and I'm assuming this is a domestic U.S. I guess I could have, that's an assumption. It could be domestic within certain countries within Latin America, but um, primarily from U.S. perspective, Marina, have, have, what have you been seeing on the domestic front? Um, I've seen a lot of interest in transfer pricing, uh, you know, with, with domestic entities. In fact, I have a client, we're at appeals right now, uh, purely domestic uh, transfer pricing issue uh, related to management services. So, um, you know, in this particular case, it's a, a you know, um, venture capital firm versus the, you know, the, the portfolio company, but I've also had situations where it's a for-profit company operating with a not-for-profit um, affiliated company. Um, anytime there's room for a, a tax differential, um, so this could be on a state tax level where, you know, you have different um, state and local tax rates that impact how a company does business. Um, I see that a lot. I also see it on the domestic front where 
uh, there are different owners of companies, um, meaning, you know, possibly uh, three people own one of the companies, but only two people own the other affiliated company or one person. And so they need to have their accounting, you know, a little cleaner, even if they're all domestic, even if they all op operate in one state. So they're, you know, the tax is all consolidated. The tax rate is all the same, you know, it's important with those intercompany transfers because we need to know where the profit belongs, where's the right place because the ownership is different or they're going on the market. They want to spin off one of the companies. They're looking for, um, you know, a, a, a buyer, right? Um, they're going to want to see in those transactional M&A deals, they want to see, you know, sort of clean lines of, of accounting and, and intercompany transfers in those cases. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, especially have especially seen an uptick in the profit, for-profit, non-profit interaction, like you mentioned. And a lot of times it's with, a lot of times it's with um, health or medical insurance type companies um, right. or financial type, where they have a non-profit type entity. And it um, it surprises people when I talk about this the subject that. The, the IRS is definitely concerned about the taxable income of that for-profit entity and that structure. And what it comes down to often is the allocation of costs. So they're saying, listen, you're allocating too many costs to that for-profit entity, reducing their taxable income. Right. And we've gone and helped clients uh, uh, with that. And it, it's just interesting because we you know, oftentimes people think in general about transfer pricing that it's cross international borders. And it has to do, you have to do this um, lengthy documentation exercise, but really there are U.S. specific federal type um, issues and state and local issues that don't require documentation per, you know, per the regulations, but the states themselves need something and want to see something. And the, and the IRS does too. And that's a really good point. I work with my domestic entities or, you know, a, a bit differently. You know, we don't have the the specific regulations and, you know, you don't need that voluminous uh, transfer pricing study. So it's a matter of, you know, an analysis on, in a PowerPoint or, you know, an analysis in a memo or whatever suits uh, the particular client. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's it's less of a... <laughs> a process. Yeah. Let's put it that way, right? That's a great point. Yeah. No, there's definitely yeah. flexibility there. Carlos, uh, how about you? How about you and Latam? Are you seeing any sort of, you know, um, tell 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 us what you're seeing there in terms of domestic rather than cross border transfer pricing? Yes, uh, in Latin America is uh, one of the uh, areas in the world where the, uh, domestic transfer pricing rules are more applicable. Most of the jurisdictions are assuming the local uh, transfer pricing rules, both for indirect taxation as well as for uh, the shifting of profits from local entities to local entities that are beneficiaries of special tax regimes. Within Latin America, we have uh, several uh, entities that may be enjoying tax benefits locally, those that are related to exports, for instance, may be eligible for a tax benefit. Therefore, the transfer pricing uh, rules internally will uh, try to determine whether or not there is a profit shifting from a tax regime to another tax regime, which is one fully uh, taxable and the other one partially or totally tax exempt. Okay. Um, so this next topic, we you know, we have Latin America financing agreements. I will just say, in general, I come across people who forget that intercompany financing agreements, lending money back and forth, whatnot, guarantees, that's related to transfer pricing. That's an intercompany transaction for between related parties, and there needs to be an arm's length rate of interest or or some type of consideration. Um, so we need to keep reminding our our folks, our clients, our tax brethren that uh, financing intercompany loans, you know, ha have to be arm's length and involve transfer pricing. Um, what about from a Latin American perspective, Carlos? What are you seeing there? Yes, mainly the uh, uh, profit uh, shifting erosion 
uh, measurements regarding the company and intercompany uh, tax deductibility is being limited by several rules, both uh, the thin capitalization rules as well as a cap on deduction regarding the EBITDA uh, as a way to avoid the inner company financing. Yet, there are several uh, other measurements still to come. There are several other uh, instruments that will control the financing agreements because there are uh, composed uh, transactions where uh, the transfer of a property or a transfer of an asset can be implicitly financed within it. So basically the, the companies that are in that position may have a problem with the intercompany financing. So uh, the, the beginning of web section four is just uh, starting to uh, see light in Latin America. And I foresee that this is going to be a struggling time for taxpayers within our region. Great, thank you. Uh, so I think I'm gonna skip this topic um, and come back to it um, at some point, but I, I wanna make sure we cover off on some country by country reporting discussions. We already covered a, l a little bit, um, but you know what we didn't cover is you know, how do we actually you know, make sure we're complying with country by country reporting. Um, I guess, Marina, I'll throw it to you first and not to put you on an island, um, I'll definitely contribute, but you know, what are you seeing from a country by country reporting, reporting perspective? I know, I, I guess from a personal perspective, let me say, I don't have a ton of clients that trip the global revenue threshold um, to required for country by country reporting, but I know it's changing for certain countries. Um, and possibly going to be lower in the future. What are you What are you seeing right now? Um, I'm seeing some very overwhelmed and overburdened, uh, you know, corporate tax departments, right? Trying to comply with this as if, as if, um, you know, they didn't have enough going on before uh, country by country reporting came into play. Um, right. it, you know, it's it's an effort, right? It's a task, and and a lot of it is not necessarily something an advisor can do for you or it doesn't necessarily make sense to spend your uh your dollars with that kind of advice because a lot of it is very much internally driven you know contacting all the controllers in the different foreign tax jurisdictions and compiling this you know voluminous amount of you know specific uh data you know by by each entity so you know i'm seeing a lot of that i'm seeing where we can help and come into play is around the um uh the sort of once you have it what do you do with it you know so you know getting getting it into the matrix or or keeping them in check with like you know the the list the checklist around it the step list you know how do we go about it and then of course the files you know whether it's the master file or the local file and also being up to date on which countries require it and don't require it because um, that is not, those are not set by country. The US, for example, does not require a master file or a local file. They still, you know, we still have our normal transfer pricing, you know, regulations and, you know, the annual contemporaneous documentation requirements that have always been there under 482. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And we've often kind of help, I'll call, I'll use the word scheme, help, you know, help somebody scheme how they're going to, you know, Get all this data and really do it efficiently and then do it annually you know and there's, there's you know there's there's the ground up you know getting the information from you know controllers and financial statements and getting it to, you know that way but then they're also at least from a us perspective having to collect it for tax purposes you know 5471s and twos right and they're different forms so it's it's a little bit of a it's not a top down but i kind of call it a top down approach where you're like okay you're collecting that data anyway let's start there and let's Let's go from there and to, to, to kind of flow into the country by country reporting perspective. I will say, you know, we, we talk about that threshold for the, the C by C report. Um, but I know some countries, you know, for example, the Netherlands, you know, requires a master file and local file, and it, and there's no threshold for that. And that's there. That's actually required now for um, for much smaller companies. It's not necessarily having to trip that, you know, 850 you know million US or 750 million euro threshold in order to do the C by C report. 
Yes, I guess that 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 threshold is a global threshold that is being set as the uh, compulsory by the OECD, but uh, jurisdictions are free to set their own threshold. And the other thing that is important to bear in mind is that uh, the fact that a country is not requiring the country by country report may trigger the right of in another country, another participant of the multinational enterprise to be able to uh, apply a SOCOP type of a rule whereby if U.S. Do, does not require the C by C report and there are substantial operations, let's say in Mexico, Mexico is able, according to local law, to uh, uh, ask and uh, require the entity that is not filing in the U.S. to file in Mexico. So basically, is giving up the right to another jurisdiction by having no local regulation on CBC reporting. So countries are, are getting into that alignment as well. Again, we are just crawling in the CBC uh, reporting era. Uh, still to uh, walk and run, and uh, we'll see what happens with the U.S. in the next future. Great, I agree. Hey, so we got we did get a question in, um, just so you're aware, on kind of um, transfer pricing and technology companies. Um, I, um, I think you know, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. We're going to be tight on time, but um, it kind of leads into a, at least a little bit into our next topic here, which is. The digital arena, which, um, yeah, sorry to use you kind of cliches, but it's kind of you know it's a little bit of the new frontier. There's not a ton of regulations or opinions or things written on the digital economy and how to deal with it from a transfer pricing perspective. You know there are more and more each day, um, but really it's it's an opportunity. It's it's a risk, but it's also an opportunity to kind of set up your transfer pricing in a way that you know can behoove you. Um, you know, obviously, as as time progresses and, and there's more, there are more laws and regulations. Um, it's going to be a little little bit tougher. Um, but for now, it's like you, we can actually set up planning in a digital world in a, in a way that actually is, is good for from a tax rate perspective. Um, Marina, what what are your thoughts on the digital economy? So I I work in this space quite a bit. You know, as we know, transfer pricing is, is industry agnostic. So my client base goes from, um, you know, m music companies to, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm working on cryptocurrency type, uh, you know, companies and Internet of Things. And, you know, I, I work a lot in this tech space. And, you know, the truth is um, transfer pricing is a bit, you know, abstract, right? It's already a bit of a gray area, you know, involving, you know, <laughs> tax, accounting, and hey, economics really is at the root of it, right? Is what's the business valuation, you know, behind this? So in order to capture, you know, the the functions and the risks and you know it's just everything is so much it, it needs some subjectivity or you know industry uh transfer pricing expertise to begin with um but you know for tech companies it's just that much more you know nebulous than it is for let's say a manufacturer of a thing of a product you know that right. you can tangibly look at and hold um and some of the questions you know I've, I've we've kind of bring them out on this slide and the next is you know like where's the server located and how do you you know attribute that if it's in one jurisdiction and everyone else is is tapping into it you know what's the value of that you know unlike again a manufacturer that has a a natural floor and ceiling you know what's your cost of raw materials what's your cost of production on one end and then what is the consumer the ultimate customer going to pay for this product on the other end you know your transfer pricing is somewhere in between it's just whatever math works within that floor or ceiling but when it comes to, to tech companies, it's just all, um, you know, it's just all so out there. Um, you know, I had said before, you need to make a clear distinction between who owns the IP and who the service provider is, because, you know, every tax authority is quick to claim IP ownership. So if you, for example, let's say we have a U.S. company and the it owns the IP, the technology that's being developed and, and drives this business, okay? So all that entrepreneurial risk is in the US located here, but 
using a, a contract shop, R&D shop in India, related party, okay, of 50 developers there, you know, that's what they do, uh, R&D services. They need to be compensated for that work, you know, not just at cost, you know, they need to make a profit. There needs to be a markup profit element to it because if you had to hire a third party to do that work for you, you know, you you better believe you'd be paying them, um, you know, to do the work. And and that's what sort of keeps the chains clean. You know, India has, India Tax Authority has less ability to claim IP ownership if the 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 corporation in India is being compensated properly for the the risks and the services uh, that it performs. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you hit it right on the nail on the head, and I think it goes back to what Carlos was saying earlier about the value chain and what we were saying about you know the the functional analysis. It, what, you know, because the question that came in was, what do you you know in terms of like data? So data, you know, big data is important and it's a, it's it, it's a key thing that a lot of companies are after or assign a lot of value to and so when it comes to transfer pricing it's what you assign the value to right so up front so what are you saying is most valuable in your business or in your supply chain is it the data that you've collected and have on customers and, and, and you know whatever you do with that um, or is it you know or is it the ability to quickly disseminate um, you know certain data or you know certain content right so, so if you start to think about where you sign the value you know we don't you know we don't mean to be as transfer pricing professionals purposely vague but it does all depend it all depends on on how you in your business you really assign sign value so is the data you've collected is that truly what is valuable then you should plan around that and and on the flip side of that you should also be prepared to document um you know the profitability of the entity that either does or does not you know, have access to that value or to that data. So, right. so it all comes again back to the functional analysis, kind of where you know, what you're assigning the value to, number one, and then who owns that. You know, both legally, you know, legally is less important, as Carlos pointed out, but economically, who's able to exploit that valuable asset that you know that belongs to the group as you know as a whole, but it specifically belongs to one particular entity. Right. It's very interesting because out of the 15 actions of BEPS, action number one is digital economy. Having said that, action number one is the only unfinished action right. of uh, BEPS. Uh, just uh, last week, uh, last meeting in, uh, in the OECD uh, Global Committee was uh, approaching the issue in New York, and the outcome of that was uh, BEPS 2.0, which is basically based upon the C by C report and having all digital economy controlled by the C by C report, which means that the trend of the threshold will have to be reduced, then the 2.0 version of BEPS is to have a global taxation with the attribution of the tax to your, the jurisdictions instead, instead of discussing where that tax shall be paid, there will be a global tax collection on digital economy, and the attribution of such a tax is going to be a minimal of an effective tax rate of 20%. Those are the first outcomes of the uh, finishing process of BEPS number one, four years after the release of the 15 actions of BEPS. So it's interesting that being action number one is still the one that is on development and is creating the bridge between the global BEPS uh, first version and the new 2.0 uh, BEPS actions. I think, Carlos, that that's really interesting and a really good point. And, and I, I think that just speaks to something we said earlier where, you know, it's the most nebulous, right, area, right? It's the most gray area, so, you know, people at at that level or you know having discussions back and forth about how to treat it and it's just not so clear um i'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of like blockchain smart contracts you know the iot type things in latin america i feel like there's a lot uh, there's a lot with that uh here in the us and bringing bringing a lot of questions yeah 
Likewise, I mean, in Latin America, mostly the uh, big uh, economical groups are getting involved in the blockchain and uh, also uh, some IT. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, Latin America is mainly a recipient of foreign investment. Therefore, as a recipient of foreign investment, these trends of the blockchain and artificial intelligence and even the digital economy is, is a concept that is getting within the regular day-to-day -day economy <coughs> as a result of the import of those activities from developed uh, I think we lost Carlos. Oh, you want to mute there? So, hey. Yeah, they're from developed countries, sorry. Okay. Hey, um, so just for keeping an eye on the time here, so you got about five minutes left. I do, um, what I'm going to do is we're going to go to the next topic. And apologies to Carlos, this is a very US specific topic, but I want to touch on it. Um, quickly. So um, it's uh, foreign derived intangible income. Um, some people refer to it as FDII. We frequently refer to it as FIDI, um, but it's part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, so the tax reform in the U.S. And it really does provide some incentive. It's really the, it's the carrot from, you know, the carrot and the stick analogy um, in terms of encouraging companies to keep or move um, IP to the U.S. and produce goods in the U.S. and sell it really on more on an export basis, but not necessarily. You can related party transactions are um, do count as well, but if you do get a reduced tax rate down to 13 and an eighth percent. Um, so just wanted to um, touch on that and throw that to you, quick, Marina. Before we we're going to jump back up to another slide to finish up, but I just wanted to throw this out to you, quick. Yeah, this is this is. Um... This is pretty great, uh, but again, I just want to caution that we need to model. So it's, you know, fitty, guilty, beat, you know, that need to be looked at in tandem. Um, but there are a lot of companies that are benefiting from this. This A lot of my clients today, you know, are benef benefiting from this. Um, and so it's a matter of just, uh, you know, it very, it's not a one-stop shop at all you know you need to look at the specifics and uh and 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 work around that but yeah i mean it's a great obviously a great tax rate to be uh reduced down to um great so to finish up um we're going to jump back up um to a slide here that we thought would be a good one to finish up on uh, marina correct me if i'm wrong this is the correct slide right i think we said uh nine right is that we there it's a compliance and strategy. This one, yes, right? this one exactly. Yep. Um, well, let me let me throw it out to you. Um, talk to us about uh, how we should finish up here on our conversation. Yeah, just quickly. I know you know we don't have too much time, but you know I think we've all the three of us have all you know spoken on both ends of it. You know, there's your compliance side. You know, different countries have different regulations, and they're all over the world at this point. Um, like you know countries in Africa you would never you know would never think of have transfer pricing regulations or follow OECD guidelines so this is a factor no matter what country country you're operating in uh, there are penalties around not complying annually with your transfer pricing documentation I know in the US they're very high 20% or 40% of the proposed adjustment that the IRS could come in with. Um, I know in other countries as well. Um, but there's also, you know, I, I, <laughs> I try to be a positive person. So I like to work in the other space, the space of the strategy and the value add. You know, it, it is really, treasure pricing is the number one tool for, you know, proactively, strategically minimizing your global effective uh, tax rate. It, it's just a, a great tool for that. So, um, you know, start it, start it early, you know, in a perfect scenario, I've, you know, we've got these sort of three uh, entities, you know, one would be like the entrepreneurial risk taker or the headquarter that owns the IP. Ideally, that would be in the lowest tax jurisdiction because that'll get the most profit in the global model as the technology blows up and, and really drives the business. Then you've got service providers, whether they're tech service providers or other, in a low labor cost jurisdiction. Um, you know, you have sales and marketing people, obviously where your customers are, because, you know, in the end, this needs to make operational sense to your business. You know, the tax doesn't drive the business, but, you know, starting off early, you can go hand in hand with the planning that way.
So great. And Carlos, you touched on this earlier. You mentioned the words compliance and strategy earlier. Um, why don't you why don't you t- you know finish up for us and talk to us um, from your perspective? Indeed, I guess that one of the things we all have to bear in mind is that most of the uh, globe is uh, aligning the transfer pricing uh, guidelines to the OECD module. In fact, one great development in Latin America is Brazilian case. Brazilian uh, transfer pricing system is always been an inside uh, viewing and they have committed already to align their system of transfer pricing to the uh, OECD module. So we are going to be just coexisting in two worlds, the US module and the rest of the world module. And this will uh, create a great deal of a challenge on the planning side as well as on the planning side. Great. And that brings us to, oh my gosh, Exactly 11 o'clock. Exactly. So, um, yeah, don't have time, for, you know, to open the mics up or anything like that for questions. But we're happy to, you know, if you want to put a question in the chat box, feel free. We'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, I guess. Oh, I guess we Great. hand it off or say goodbye. Yeah. And- well, wait. Two two quick things. One is that if you have a tax question and it, after this event, you can always email tax at hlbi at I'm sorry tax at hlb dot global and that will come to the international tax committee and we will get it over to marina jason and carlos and get you an answer and the second thing i want to remind you of is the last tuesday in february we will have the fourth in our series of webinars and it will be on brexit so look for the announcement of that webinar coming up one in one month the last tuesday of february Thanks again. Bye-bye. Cheers.